You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. We are going to talk leadership today and an opportunity to learn more uh, as a leader, how to develop and grow as a leader with our friends at Concordia University, Wisconsin. We're grateful for your support, Concordia University, Wisconsin. Thanks for uh, being a partner with us here on The Coffee Hour. You can find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. Joining us today, Dr. Elizabeth Bennett. She's Associate Professor and Director of the Master of Science in Leadership at the Batterman School of Business at Concordia University, Wisconsin. Thanks so much for joining us today, Dr. Bennett. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to talk all things leadership. (laughs) And I I should mention that this program is Concordia University, Wisconsin, and the program is also at Concordia University Ann Arbor as well, correct? That's correct. So the, the program we'll be talking about today is available at both Concordia University Ann Arbor, Concordia University, Wisconsin, and we're talking leadership. So let's start with your story. When did the, what, what's the beginning of your leadership story and what helped you grow as a leader? That's a really great question. When I think back, it's been sort of a long history, probably dating myself in terms of when I really entered the professional work world in the 1990s. But I can think of really three really pivotal moments that kind of shaped who I am and my passion for leadership now. But the first one was the first professional full-time, you know, benefited position that I got, which was about a year and a half after graduating with an English degree. And I graduated into a recession as, you know, many of our listeners have done the same thing in the 2000s and and on. So it's not, they're no stranger to that experience. But that, that first professional position, I didn't realize what an amazing company I was working for. It was a life insurance company that had just, they, they gave you the path of success. They were part of the re-engineering of the 1990s where they were bringing in emergent leadership, self-directed work teams. So I actually got to participate in those types of trainings and that got me interested in leadership development and particularly looking at how they processed people through problem solving and, and where they looked for those emerging leaders to then raise up and promote through the ranks. They really did it well, and I I didn't actually understand what an amazing culture they were set by leadership in a very deliberate fashion until I went to other places and realized that the way it's done in different places, it can be a highly variable experience where you might have a so-so organizational culture or maybe even a negative organizational culture. So that was a very pivotal moment for me. In sort of thinking back, kind of the next pivotal moment that brought me to graduate work was I uh, moved down south. So I was in New England, um, moved down south and took a position in industrial engineering at a clock manufacturing plant. And I w- you know, was doing some industrial engineering type activities, but also I was the plant training administrator. So any, any non-HR related training, things like supervisory training, blueprint reading, you know, we were early uh, adopters in um, computer-based education as well. And I had this pivotal moment where I had brought people off the floor for training. And we were supposed to be giving everybody in a certain classification the same opportunities for training and promotion. So it was required training. And I had an elderly gentleman who was probably, he probably had 30, almost 40 years of age on me. And I started running into just severe resistance. And I was like, you know, who am I? I had this young 20-something telling somebody who's very close to retirement that, that he has to be part of this uh, training. And I realized there, there's a sort of sudden flash of insight. I, I realized that he was probably illiterate. And, and then it's like, that was a problem I never expected to have. And so how did I handle that? Um, that was, uh, you know, a significant step because it brought me to these deep questions of leadership and Leadership and learning in an organizational setting and the expectations of an employer um, mapped onto you know, maybe where somebody doesn't want to do the training and doesn't want to, to go through these things. That level of, of just experiential resistance was very significant. So I ended up actually moving forward with a degree at the University of Georgia in human resource and organizational development, which includes leadership and learning and change management and all those wonderful things around org development. So that was very, those questions, those very practice-based questions brought me to study further. And I guess the last pivotal moment is when, you know, after the doctorate, spent a little time in a tenure line position, but then ended up taking a position in medical education. So it's a very interesting environment. It's really 
a higher education to workforce development position. We are, uh, I was an executive leader over uh, a set of offices in academic affairs at the Western campus of Tufts University School of Medicine. So this was an academic medical center. And so I had the executive leadership responsibilities uh, on top of uh, also being faculty with Tufts. So all the expectations for the work around research and scholarship and using research skills to solve organizational problems. And it was in that position that I started to really understand the responsibilities of a leader, you know, and, and it's through experience and reaching a level of resilience because you, you, you don't, not everything goes your way, right? Not everything goes your way. You end up having the battle scars of experience. Well, you know, that didn't go as well as I, you know, as I ought to. And that reflection, that really is significant for leadership development. And I would say that one of the things that I observed in that time was a recognition that my own preference for leadership is not everybody else's preference. And I found myself having to adapt my leadership style to the people. For example, I had one employee that, you know, I, I'm more consensus driven. You know, I, I like to have things a little bit more democratic, you know, consensus building within our team environment, more empowerment, acting as a thinking partner, that kind of thing. But I had an employee that wanted step-by-step -step direction. I had to learn to be a more directive leader. Uh, for that person's need. And that when you when you look at leadership development theory, it's like, okay, th there are different approaches depending on the personality of the leader, their experiences, their comfort level, but also the needs of the employee, the people that are your collaborators. Um, so I would say those are those are really significant pivotal moments for me that shape me in terms of my own leadership and also where I try to shape the MSL in preparing our students to be leaders in the it is really amazing how much you learn about yourself when you have to learn how to lead other people. I know I've gone through that process quite a bit since I started my own leadership program. So it's it's just so interesting the insights you get about how you actually function and how you have to function when you're in a team as well. And maybe some places you have to change too. It's very insightful. But what you told some great stories talking about good company culture and maybe not so great company culture, but what are some of the key things that make a good company culture, good leadership? Absolutely. You know, there can be, interestingly enough, there's about 4% higher chance of someone being a narcissist in leadership than in the general population. That doesn't surprise me. Right. And so you have to question some of our old assumptions that if somebody rises to leadership, there must be something noble or good about them. Right. Uh, sometimes it's quite the opposite. Sometimes people rise to leadership out of self-interest and ambition that may or may not be for the good of the company. Mm -hmm. And so you have to kind of turn that on its head. The, the other thing that we have to question at times, too, is the idea of traits. It, it used to be that our image of the perfect leader, uh, if you look at the origins of leadership theory um, is really based on the assumption that people were born to be leaders rather than developing into leaders. And, and certainly there are people that have, they, they, they really have very strong leadership skills from the get-go. There are people out there, but the reality is a lot of leaders fail. I think I saw an estimate in one research study that, that about 50% of leaders are not competent for their position. And that, that is not very encouraging. So you, you have to have a you know, a process for bringing people along. And that process um, involves feedback. So an organization that is intentionally moving their culture in a given direction, they have to use their leadership. The, the leadership is really what sets the direction. They set the strategy, the vision. They guide how problem solving occurs. And what we know of organizational culture is that the solutions that work well enough to be used in the future and to share with new, new employees, that becomes part of the culture. And so there's this dynamic problem solving and movement of culture over time. So there's, it's, it's really quite a paradox because culture is both stable and dynamic at the same time. There's something core about the culture that, that moves forward, but then, it, it, you know, you have new applications, new problem solutions. And so it does move and adapt over time. Leaders are highly significant in setting a good direction because they hold the power of the purse, the power of good or bad assignments, who stays in the system and who doesn't. You know, it's not enough to be explicit to say, hey, we value this. 
you have to live it. And, and that was actually one of the things that was a big aha moment for me when I did my dissertation. So I studied uh, organizational internet uh, at a community hospital from the perspective of knowledge management and organizational culture. And when I asked interviewees about what is the culture of the organization, they would turn their badge over and say, here are our values and start with like honesty and integrity. That's very common. Honesty and integrity is one that you see, not universal, but close to. But what honesty and integrity means in a given place is going to be different depending on, on the organization, you know, how they actually live out those values. Some places don't actually mean it. Or they give special dispensation to their leaders to not be honest and transparent and have integrity. So to actually make those values work, you have to live it. And so leaders are, are really significant in how they uh, support or undermine the values of the organization. And sometimes you can have leaders that are anomalies. They might be very good or very poor leaders and they create a subculture. They create, you know, a, a different, something that's different from the grain of the organization. So it's a very complex thing. And, you know, part of what we try to do is, is prepare people for going into those contexts and understanding the power of leadership for setting direction, but also the power of organizational culture to sometimes kick leaders out of the system if they don't belong. We're learning about leadership and an opportunity to develop as a leader with Concordia University, Wisconsin and Ann Arbor today with Dr. Elizabeth Bennett. We'll continue the conversation in just a moment right here on The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Our guest today, Dr. Elizabeth Bennett, Associate Professor and Director of the Master of Science in Leadership at the Batterman School of Business at Concordia University, Wisconsin. And the program is also at Concordia University, Ann Arbor as well. Uh, just a, a moment ago, you were talking about how we have viewed leadership in the past and our continual learning about leadership and understanding of how leaders may not necessarily always be born, but rather developed or, or grown. What, what is key in developing leaders today? Is there an important foundation to have before even building on that to develop leadership? Absolutely. If you look at the keys of effective leadership, what's interesting about it, it isn't just about technical competence. So there is a difference between being a manager and a leader. A manager is really focused on the tactical, the day-to-day, -day, and they are likely in a formal position of authority. A manager may also be a leader in terms of being strategic and that having that social relationship with their followers or collaborators. And so you have to kind of think about what is that balance between the, the technical and the, the people orientation and the strategic. So one of the foundations that we talk about is uh, an integration of the technical and the people, not just one or the other, but that integration. Um, but really with a heavy focus in on human-centered leadership and what it takes to promote um, a solid team, a solid group, solid organization that can meet the mission and vision of the organization. So it's always strategic back to what is the purpose of this organization? What is the purpose of this group? And then setting direction. Leaders, they have the time in theory, they have the time to be looking ahead. So it's not sufficient just to look at where we are right now. They always have to be looking ahead. They have been peering around the corner and coming up with strategy of how to get to a new future and even imagining multiple futures. Those are highly conceptual skills, but then they also have to be able to communicate those potential futures in such a way that they motivate their people to reach out and embrace those potential futures with hope and optimism. That's very hard because 
a lot of times you don't want to have your job change. You, you know, you'd like to stay, you're satisfied in the way, you know, the day-to-day, it's great, you know, it's, you know, but organizations have to like grow. There's such a thing as organizational life cycle where, you, you know, you have a ramp up phase. It's like learning to walk as a child. You sort of have a, a young adult and, and the mid-level phase, but then you have a phase at the end where you uh, either die, you know, and, and the organization closes or you have organizational renewal. And it takes a lot of change management to get people on board with organizational renewal. It often means significantly altering what the organization was about. So they take on whatever's the new, new, new endeavor, the new, new initiatives. So think about that, that, that combination of looking at evidence, looking at data, but also having the people skills. So we call these, instead of calling people skills or soft skills, we call them power skills. And the reason for that is to reorient how people view them. The people skills or soft skills, sometimes we think of those as easy. They're not the must-haves. They're, you know, you can dispense with them over the technical. But it turns out that these skills are really the main power levers that you have to lead and change your organization, lead and inspire. You want to hear a few of them? Uh, Sure. Yeah. Sure. So adaptability, self-awareness, emotional intelligence including self-awareness, um, being strategic, analytical, um, being able to make evidence-based decisions, empowerment, and, yeah, and, and that goes along with inspiring people towards that new future, conflict resolution. And sometimes conflict resolution is, is not what you think. Sometimes I, I don't make a decision. Sometimes I get people in a room together so that they communicate. And so it's not necessarily trying to solve other people's problem for them, but to actually get them to communicate and work forward to, collectively with a solution. So I say humility, it's a big one. You know, having, and that goes along with that adaptability. Another one is having a growth mindset. So a growth mindset is you, you look at people from the lens of they can grow and progress. Whereas a fixed mindset is like, you're a good writer or you're a bad writer and you can't really become a good writer. You know, it's naturally built in. A growth mindset is completely opposite that where you think that someone can learn and grow and can develop. Um, but let me just mention with adaptability, we, we, I've seen studies that looked at leadership style and um, they were trying to figure out, is there one best leadership style? And the answer was no. They were trying to look at, you know, leaders that were effective, who stayed in the system, leaders who kind of either left or were fired out of the system. And they could not find a pattern of one perfect leadership style. What they found was the people that were able to be successful were ones that were able to take responsibility for mistakes, not blame other people. And they were able to adapt their leadership style to the needs of the context. So that adaptability is so key. And that's one reason why we teach a number of different leadership approaches in the program. I love how many layers there are to this. It's not just one thing. There are so many things, so many different puzzle pieces to what goes into good leadership. And yet they all connect. Like you, you have to have all of these pieces and, and understand how all of that works together. And it's just, I love to, I could talk about this all day, but we only have a few more minutes. So, so yeah. talk more, you mentioned some of the coursework. So let's get into what are some of the key courses that uh, are available through this? Absolutely. I, I love to talk courses. So a student coming into the program will find themselves doing the leadership foundation. So that's a series of four courses. And what we do is we give is intensive work around leadership approaches. So they'll start off looking at leadership theories and approaches. So they get a, a broad range of the ways things are done and um, the options open them. And they'll, they'll say, you know, transformational leadership is more appealing to me or one of these other theories uh, is uh, more interesting to me. So they'll go in, go in depth with uh, a few of those to really uh, understand them from the inside out. They'll uh, delve into um, self-leadership. So they really focus in on, you know, if I'm going to lead other people, I need to be the leader of myself and of my own learning and development. So we go through an entire process of, uh, of self-leadership. And that includes a number of different types of assessments that they do to kind of gauge where they are and where they want to grow. Um, at the end of that course, actually, that works really well moving into what we call relational leadership. So understanding that I'm different from other people. So how do we work within relation within one another, with, with one another? So we go into the relational leadership. And then finally, in that uh, series, we have leadership competencies where they get the opportunity. So we, we were very heavily focused in on not only looking at scholarship and approaches to understand leadership conceptually, 
but we're always interested in application to practice, whether it's one's own practice or going out for experiential learning. So we actually have students build an interview guide that looks at those very general competencies around leadership, some of the ones that we've already talked about. But they also look at domain specific. So for example, we have somebody who's a pastor or a teacher or a business person or an athletic coach. These are, these are very common profiles for some of our students. They might look at what's domain specific for their area and research that. And that becomes part of the opportunity to interview a leader, to shadow them, and to also get some evidence collection, some, some data collection experience. So it's really important to us that our students have technical skills, they make presentations, they use the technology. The program is 100% online, which is nice. It's a special feature because we have, it's interdisciplinary and it's not bound by time zone. We have people from all different areas and that sharing of experience and application in different environments is, you know, really enhances the learning community. So we really try to emphasize that. But we do focus on evidence-based decision-making. So they take an analytics course, introduce them to research and research ethics, leadership ethics, and then that eventually culminates in a capstone where they take a leadership problem practice they, they don't do a dissertation. It's not, it's not to the level of precision of a dissertation, but it allows them to collect data that would get to the point of making recommendations for changes in practice. So it gives them that hands-on experience with evidence-based decision-making. And that's really what we're trying to produce at the end of the day is, is people who can make wise and good decisions as leaders. Why is now a good time to grow and develop as a leader? It's not just a good time, it's a crucial time. We are facing some major challenges in the economy and in society. And I don't know if you're familiar with a theory called the fourth turning by Strauss and Howe, but the fourth turning looks at basically generations as archetypes. And when they come in and out of crisis, their theory is looking at us going into crisis, which is me, you know, which means a social unraveling. And it just makes a lot of sense with all the, you know, the differences in, you know, expectations for society, for social values and order, you know, belief in institutions. Artificial intelligence and digital transformation, these are major, major upheavals that are hitting society now. So, you know, with the launch of chat GPT, for example, to really become part of public consciousness, what AI can do and where it's heading. We're look at, looking at major job loss and basically, you know, we having organizations need to lead through this, this minefield of, of new technology. So we need people that have ethical values and human-centered values to properly lead the people through, but also to set strategic direction as to when we should use AI and when not. How do we completely redesign the work that we're doing in such a way that, again, it continues to fulfill the organizational mission? It reminds me of the 1990s re-engineering. It, it really does, except I think it's off the charts. I think it's going to be off the charts. So we need to be taking our time preparing people for the future and focusing in on upskilling and reskilling of people so that they can adapt to AI and how it augments work and in some cases prepare to move and pivot into new careers. It's, it's, right, it's already here and it's further on the horizon. So this is a significant challenge. And it's interesting to me when I think about the fourth turning, it's that crisis and the leaders of Generation X, I'm, I'm Generation X, we've known for like 20 years based on that theory that Generation X is going to have to pick up the pieces of major economic and social people, and we're already seeing it. Um, so it, they, there is some validity, uh, it seems at least uh, observational validity in their theory based on what we're seeing right now. So definitely a crucial time to develop leaders who can lead, who have the courage, the moral courage and the optimism and the human centered values, the ethics to lead in this time. We have just about a minute left, but who who would benefit from leadership development? I would say everybody. <laughs> I would say everybody, but we have we have at least three different types of students. We have students that just love the people side of things. They think of themselves people oriented, and they they just they just naturally gravitate to leadership as a content area. We have some professions that have significant people orientation. You know, athletic coaches. We. we quite often have athletic coaches who come in from their undergrad, they go into a coaching position. They'll come in or continue to develop their leadership skills because they're directly applied. And then the third area, which is actually a, a, a really cool area, are the people that rose up through 
with technical competence in, let's say, engineering or one of these, you know, healthcare or, you know, one of these very highly technical careers. And they realize they can only go so far on just the technical foundation. And so they might be mid-level moving into upper level. And so they need to build the strategic and people skills, those change management skills. So those come in mid-level. So we, we have people at all levels coming in. So really the program can deal with problems of practice at any level. And for any of those three, those are the typical archetypes of our students. Where can we learn more about the programs and how to apply? Absolutely. So the best way is going to our website and I'm going to read it out. It's a little bit complicated, but it's cuw.edu forward slash academics forward slash programs forward slash leadership hyphen masters. Uh, and if you didn't catch that, we'll make sure the link is available to you after the program. Uh, and you can also search literally Google, in Concord, you know, Concordia, Wisconsin and MSL, and it'll bring you right to our page. Very good. And we'll provide those links in the program notes today as well. Our guest today, Dr. Elizabeth Bennett, Associate Professor and Director of the Master of Science and Leadership, the Batterman School of Business, Concordia University, Wisconsin, and Concordia University, Ann Arbor. Thank you so much for being our guest today, Dr. Bennett. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you. Anytime. Anywhere. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store.